Daniel. Your prophecy will reveal the secrets to the end of the world. Stay faithful. Stay brave. And no matter what, obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Deciphering Daniel with Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr. I'm a little bit sad today because this is the end of our study, Deciphering Daniel. And what I hope to do is to share with you some things that this study has taught me personally. And I'm expecting that you've learned these same lessons. So what we're gonna try to do is go through all 12 chapters and pull out these nuggets. Now, the study was 25 messages long, and there are more than 10 things that I've learned, but these are the things that popped out, and I hope that you've been blessed as we studied the book of Daniel. Now, obviously, it's a book of prophecy, and that's what sets the Bible apart from any other religious document. There's nothing like the Bible. It has, it has predicted major things in the world like uh, the rise and fall of the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. It has given us details about some of these empires that are astounding. And it also has predicted things yet to come. That's what I'm most excited about. When? is the end of the world. I'm not sure when, but I know the things that are laid out in Daniel and other books of the Bible are going to come to pass because the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled exactly as predicted. The Bible is about a quarter prophetic and two-thirds of those of those things that have been predicted have already come to pass. That gives, me, that gives me great confidence in that last third of the things that the Bible has predicted, that these will come to pass. When? I'm not sure, but I'll just tell you this. I feel like it's going to be soon. I really, really do. Before we get into the, the 10 things that Daniel has taught me, I want to revisit something that we ended with last time and try to give us a, a, a full understanding of some of these unusual days, numbers of days, that Daniel ended with. Remember in Daniel 12, verse 11, it said, from the time that the daily sacrifice, okay, what is this daily sacrifice? This is the sacrifice in the Jewish temple. That means that there's going to be a Jewish temple rebuilt, We'll be going back to Israel in a few weeks, and we're going to be filming a series on rebuilding the temple. And there are rabbis that have invited us there to talk about the red heifer sacrifice, which is something that they desperately need, well, they need to, to purify the nation so that they can resume the, the temple sacrifices. And they already have a lot of the implements ready to go. They have a cornerstone, they have plans, they have financing, they have priests, they have garments, everything's ready to go. There's a big problem, and that is the Dome of the Rock is in, in the way. So what will solve that, we really don't know, but I do know there's a massive yearning in Israel today to rebuild the temple. And Daniel predicts that in the tribulation, there will be a temple. Now that's the temple that the Antichrist will allow to be built, but... We do know that the daily sacrifices halfway through will be taken away. This is called the abomination of desolations. And this was predicted by Daniel, of course by God through Daniel, and it also is referenced in the book of Revelation. And then we have these days, and these were a little mysterious. There shall be 1,290 days. Now remember, we already talked about 1,260 days, and that was half of the tribulation. 30-day months, prophetic months, 42 months is 1,260 days. But what is the 1,290 days? And then there's another one. <clears throat> Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 
35 days. So we have these two days, we are, uh, numbers of days. We already talked about this, but let's re, uh, go over those again. We don't know for sure what this is, but we just, out of the blue, picked a date. The date that we chose that would make sense that the abomination of desolation is going to happen in the tribulation is the ninth of Av. Why is that a, a date that makes sense? Look at the prophecy chart. Here we have the final week of Daniel that has yet to be fulfilled of the 70 weeks. This is seven years. Each day of the week is a year. We have the Antichrist is going to be part of that. This is called the Tribulation. It is written about in Revelation 11. We have a division. Each division is 1,260 days or three and a half years, 42 months. So in the middle, what happens right here in the middle of the Tribulation? Well, the Bible says that the Antichrist will desecrate the temple. How? He will do something similar that the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes did. He, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes slaughtered a pig. He stopped the sacrifices. He killed Jews. It's going to be a horrible, horrible time for the Antichrist uh, is going to do some of these very same things. So let's just say the ninth of Av does make sense because that's the day that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple. And that's also the day that Titus in Rome destroyed the, the second temple, that the third temple would be desecrated on that same day. Now, I'm not saying this is for sure. I'm just saying this is conjecture, okay? Everyone understand what I just said? I'm not saying this is Bible. Don't go out and say, well, Pastor Scudder said the abomination of des desolations will occur on the 9th of Av. I did not say that. I say it's possible, okay? So if we use that date as a starting point, what do we get with 1,290 days. Well, what we come to is the Feast of Purim. From the middle of the tribulation, we know that the end of the tribulation will be the return of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, Jesus Christ is now the king, and we go on into a thousand year rule and reign. There might be a few days in there from the end of the tribulation to the beginning of the millennium to clean up. And, and, and Purim, was the Jewish celebration of a, 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 a wicked man named Haman who was trying to annihilate the Jewish people. That, that, that was thwarted in the story of Esther and Mordecai. And they celebrate that every year that God spared them from annihilation. Now we have a much wicked, much more wicked man, the Antichrist, that is also trying to annihilate the Jewish people. It would make sense 30 days after the second coming of Christ that they might celebrate that they survived, okay, in that post-tribulational um, uh, a, a remembrance of Purim, okay? So it's possible of what the 1,290 days. What about the 1,335 days? Well, we also have, um, the, if we use the ninth of Av, we can bring that out it brings us to the 24th of Nisan. Now remember, last time I said this may be the Feast of uh, First Fruits or Shavuot. Feast of First Fruits. Why do I say maybe? Because that day varies. It's the first day after the first Sabbath after Passover. Now, if you if you just did the mental gymnastics with what I just said, you know that Jesus arose on the first day after the Sabbath, after Passover. So Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection because he arose, all that put their faith in him, or all before he came, put their faith in the coming Messiah, we all are guaranteed a bodily, physical resurrection. When you see someone put into the grave who has died, but they died in Christ, they're saved. That body is going to decompose and rot, but God will resurrect that body and make it glorified and fit for eternity. So we're gonna have our, our, our physical bodies for eternity, but it won't have the curse of sin anymore. And it will be made fit for an environment like heaven. And it's gonna be a glorious day. I long and I look forward to that day. We just returned on a seven day rafting trip in the Grand Canyon and I feel it. 
I feel it. I feel like uh, my, the full outer layer of my skin has been sandblasted away. Um, I, I lost about 10 pounds after I took my first shower after getting out, and that was just sand coming out of my ears and my nose. It was a, it was a crazy a windstorm. They actually had 80 mile an hour winds in Arizona that was kicking up dust storms. Well, we're in the Grand Canyon, and it's just whipping that, that uh, wind and that dust and the sand, but it was a blast. It was a, it was a sand blast. Uh, y- you look past some of those hard things, and, and we had one guy on the trip that I had interviewed for an In Grace episode from Alaska, and he had just come back from Ukraine. And he's like, listen, this might seem kind of hard, that what we're going through, but it's nothing like these women and children in basements in Mariupol. And he's right. He's right. But we had a, a, uh, a, a bit of a hard time, uh, you know, sunburn and, and, you know, water hitting you and you're cold and then you're hot and, and you ache a little bit and, and you're kind of you're, you're kind of feeling your age. Well, there's a day when you're not going to have those aches and pains anymore and it's going to be a glorious day when we, rece- when we receive that glorified body in the resurrection that Jesus guaranteed by him rising again. He's the first fruit and that first fruit guarantees the rest and that's what Jesus is. So, if that 1,335 days is after the abomination of desolation, so sometime into or right before the millennium, perhaps would that be the resurrection? We know there's a resurrection of tribulation saints. Could that be the day that they would be resurrected? There are many that will die in the tribulation that will have faith in Jesus, and maybe that's the day their body rise. And then after the, the, after the millennium, we know that those that died uh, will be resurrected for an eternity in hell. So perhaps that's what that number is. It is the, the feast of first fruits, and it would represent another resurrection of tribulation saints. Now, since we're counting these certain lengths of times found in the book of Daniel at the end, I thought it was appropriate to go back to a number that I didn't really talk about in detail. Maybe some of you were wondering, why didn't Pastor Scudder expound on Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13 when it says, I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? How long is this going to continue to happen? And then he said unto me, unto 2,000 and 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We didn't go into any detail on that, and you were probably wondering why. Well, let's talk about it in light of those other two dates that we don't find anywhere else in Scripture, any of these date, these days. So let's say we use the 9th of Av again as the starting point for this, this, this stopwatch. And we, we count 2,300 days. What do we come to? We come to the 29th of Kislev. What is the 29th of Kislev? Well, that's right in the middle of another feast, the Festival of Lights, and this is Hanukkah. Okay? And it says, look back at the verse, the sanctuary be cleansed. Perhaps... That long after the middle of the tribulation, the Lord will have cleansed and purified the millennial temple. We don't know for sure any of these things, but it seems interesting to me that these dates fall on dates that would make sense. So, how long until these things come to pass? How long? I don't know, but I do think it's going to be soon. Now, let's, let's learn 10 things that Daniel has taught me. Number one, these are very practical things. These are things, these are things that will help you in your life. Number one, live up to your name. Live up to your name. You, you say, well, I don't have a biblical name. Well, you know what? You, you do have a name. You do have a name. You're a child of God. 
You, you are a child of the king. Sometimes my dad would say, act like a scutter. <laughs> I knew what that meant. Stop doing what I was doing. Live up to your name. Let's look at Daniel 1, verse 6. It says, now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You need to know what these names mean. Daniel means, God is my judge. What a wonderful name. God is my judge. Every time you hear, every time he heard Daniel as a child, he heard, God is my judge. Hananiah means Jehovah, Jehovah shows grace. Mishael means who is what God is. And Azariah means Jehovah is my help. You have a name. Live up to your name as a child of God. Every time, maybe even in captivity, you think that's why the Babylonians changed their name? And their name represented something that had to do with the pagan gods. But even though their names were changed, they still had a name. And that name reflected something about the one true God. There is one true God. There is a creator of heaven and earth, and there's only one. And friends, every time they heard their name as a child, or even in captivity, I'm sure they called each other by their Hebrew names, they were reminded of who they were. You, if you've received by faith Jesus Christ, are a child of God. You are in Christ. He's in you by the Spirit of God. And he has a whole series of things that, that you're going to go through to conform you to his image. You are being conformed to the image of Christ. Never forget that. Never forget your name, Christian. One who follows Jesus Christ. Number two. I think this is one of the big picture items that we learn in Daniel, and that is God will judge sin. Never has a nation or an individual, a believer or an unbeliever, escaped this. Now, if you're a believer, you don't have to fear hell, which is wonderful, because you've been saved. Here's what happens when you uh, believe in Jesus as your, as your only hope, as your savior. You pass from death to life. You're receiving a pardon from all of your sins, past, present, and future. Jesus paid for your sins. He offers you a pardon to escape the penalty, which is eternal hell. You've accepted that. Now you have eternal life. You have it now. You say, what if I give it back? What if I renounce Christ? What if I say, I don't believe this anymore? Well, some have. But if they've genuinely received that pardon, it doesn't matter what they do after that. Now it's a horrible testimony for someone to, to reject God after they've received by faith Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 6 and 10, 10 warned us that there is a, a fiery judgment for that person, but it's the judgment seat of Christ. It's loss of rewards. It's not eternal hell. And that's something you have to remember. Once you've been born into God's family, you will never, ever, ever, ever be cast out. That's an important thing to remember. Why? Because we stumble in this life. We mess up in this life. Even after we've received Jesus by faith. Now, God will judge sin. We're gonna have to do something that the Bible calls reaping and sowing. Let's look at Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Just because you are a, a believer just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that God uh, negates this law. If you, if you sow to the flesh, you're gonna reap of the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, you're gonna reap of the Spirit. So let's all sow to the Spirit each and every day of our lives because God will judge sin. Never mistake God's long-suffering for tolerance. You remember that? God is going to judge Israel, or did judge Israel, and did judge Judah. Remember, they were, they were a divided kingdom at this time. Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been taken captivity by the Assyrians. Now Judah was being taken into captivity by Babylon. Why? Because they were turning it away from God. They weren't following the Lord. Now he's promised them the land forever, and that will never change. But he said, you know what? You're gonna go into a time of uh, 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 punishment. I, I would call it uh, correction. 
and we're going to take you away from your land. You're going to go back, but for these 70 years, you're going to be in captivity. Why did Judah last a little bit longer? Because they had a few more godly kings. But eventually, both uh, Judah and Israel went into captivity because God was, was disciplining them for them not following his, his ways. And that, that can happen. God will deal with the sin of an individual and the sin of a nation. God will deal with the sin of a believer and the sin of an unbeliever. Now, he deals with our sin differently as believers because he, he lovingly chastens us. The sin of an unbeliever is dealt with 100% differently because they're, they're rejecting the truth of, a, of one true God and his offer of salvation. So, remember that. God will judge sin. God will judge sin. Number three, serving is no accident. You have to purpose, purpose to, to serve. You have to make this a priority in your life. Young people, teenagers, we're gonna be working with our teenagers from our church and some of our sister churches this week at a high school camp. And I'm actually looking forward to it because it's gonna be less grueling than my last week has been. Even hanging out with teenagers uh, at a camp, but we're gonna challenge them to purpose in their heart, to serve the Lord, to not defile themselves. We live in a wicked world. Serving is no accident. Look at Daniel 1.8. But Daniel, remember this is when he was a teenager. This is early on in his captivity. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This is the key word, though. Daniel purposed. He made it a point to make this decision, first in his heart, in his innermost being, in his mind, to what? Not defile himself. What was the problem? Well, the king's meat certainly wasn't kosher. And Daniel lived under the dietary laws of Israel. And those dietary laws were to set them apart as a unique nation, a peculiar people. We've also been set apart. No, we don't follow those dietary laws, but we still have to purpose in our heart not to defile ourselves, not to defile ourselves with the pollution of the world, with the, what's streaming, what's, what's being shown is just pure wickedness. Almost everything out there that, that, it, that you're being shown or, or, or even the music has, has just wickedness in it. And, and are we to be entertained by those things? No. We have, we have a whole new path. We have a different way. We need to serve by first purposing in our heart that we're not gonna defile ourselves, just like Daniel did. But think about Babylon. It was the wonder of the world. It was a stunning place with the hanging gardens the massive walls, the palaces, the temples, the commerce, the, the great Euphrates River, the culture, the boundless wealth. Babylon was a great and mighty civilization. And now Daniel is taken out of the godly environment that he was in and is plopped down into this wicked but impressive and amazing place. What is he going to do? Remember, he's young. He's young. Someone said, youth is purer than manhood, but then it is weaker and easily influenced. And that is a true statement. A young person is purer, but easily influenced. Number two, not only was he young, but he was away from home. He didn't have the influence of his godly parents anymore. He could pretty much do whatever he wanted to do. You think at this point he would just live large and have fun and just enjoy. He didn't. Why? Because he knew that that was a sinful lifestyle. If he were to just do all of that, he would be breaking God's law. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Teenagers, you can serve the Lord, even in this wicked world that we live in. You can. Don't just check out. Don't just rebel. If you do that, you're going to eventually learn that you're wrong, but you're going to have a lot of scars in your life along the way. He was also helpless. He didn't have people to protect him and help him and guide, guide him. He was a captive in a strange land. But Daniel decided he wasn't in 
Babylon to win a popularity contest. He didn't care how many likes or dislikes his social media feed had. He wasn't there to impress people. He knew it was better to be on God's side than on the side of the mighty king and culture of Babylon. Can you commit to that? To saying, I am not going to sin in my life. I'm gonna allow the Spirit of God to help me in all of these things. I wanna serve the Lord. Purpose in your heart today to make that happen. Galatians 6, 14 says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that we should ever glory in. It's not about your position. It's not about your bank account. It's not about your life uh, style, your, your, your affluency, your house, your car. It's not about any of those things. If God blesses, then praise the Lord. Let's use that for his glory. But let us only glory in one thing, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, your faith is gonna be tried. The temptation of today is the same as the temptation back then. You're tempted to float along the current of the world. The Colorado River moves at four miles an hour on average. In the last rapids that we went through, I think that number was ticked up a lot. It's called Lava Falls. The reason they call it Lava Falls is because uh, near the, the mile that we were at, so we started at Lee's Ferry, which is a very typical starting point for the Grand Canyon rafting trip, and we exited about 180 miles later. And right before the 180 miles where we were helicoptered out and then uh, flown out on a small plane, right before that was an area of volcanism in the Grand Canyon. A lot of volcanoes had erupted and the lava had flowed and blocked the river. And one of those lava flows had created this crazy rapids. And it was, it was unbelievable how fast you shoot down that and walls of water are hitting you. It'd be almost impossible to go up that rapid, but you know what? Don't just float down the current of the world. That's the easy thing to do. Float down the current of the world. There was actually this one jet boat. Whoever invented jet boats decided he was gonna shoot lava falls upstream. And it took him many attempts, and I think he about killed himself many times, but eventually he succeeded in going upstream over lava falls. I wanna challenge you Christians, don't just go with the flow. Your, your, your faith is gonna be tested, it's gonna be tried. Your faith is gonna be put on trial. Let me ask you this, if your faith is put on trial, will you be found guilty? Acts 5, 29 says, we ought to obey God rather than men. And Daniel had a lot of testings, didn't he? He had to leave home. He had to keep from defilement. He had to interpret dreams. He had to sleep with the lions. He had to understand prophetic visions. And Daniel and his friends learned over and over, obedience to God is better than life itself. Remember the fiery furnace? What a trial of their faith. But if they hadn't gone through that trial and refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue, they would never have experienced the miracle of being saved from that furnace. That furnace that killed people that threw them in. And they walked around with not a hair singed, without any smoke on their clothes. And there was also a fourth man in that furnace. One that looked like the Son of God, and I believe it was the Son of God, in that furnace with them. Your faith is gonna be tried, it's gonna be tested, but when you go through those trials, you're gonna come out with incredible stories of God's grace and faithfulness. There's a family in this church that's going through a really horrible trial right now. It's gonna be a long trial. Let me encourage all of you, but especially that one family, that God can and will get the glory even in the midst of this trial. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Number five, God elevates the humble and lowers the proud. How quickly was it that this intelligent, 
successful king, Nebuchadnezzar, with all the glory of his kingdom and all the gold and buildings and beauty, how quickly was he reduced to a mere animal, crawling around, eating grass, his hair growing long, his nails growing long. God will humble you unless you humble yourself. The Christian life, I tell you, if there's one thing about the Christian life, it's, it's humility. Never allow yourself to be elevated because that's us elevating ourselves. Now, God lifts you up, that's great. But, but if, if you are prideful in any way, ask God for help in that area because he will humble you if you don't humble yourself. What a testimony Daniel had. Daniel and his humility. What did he do? He became the prime minister of two world empires. What a testimony. Now you say, well, how do I do that? I need wisdom. How, how, do, how do I accomplish this? How do I stay humble? Let me just give you a, a, a verse for this. Um, if you want to be used of God, ask him to, for wisdom. And that's what James 1.5 tells us. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If you're proud, the writing is on the wall. If you are humble, God will lift you up. You remember the writing on the wall? Another scene in our incredible book of Daniel? The pride, the fall of the Babylonian Empire that night. If you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he'll give it to you. The next one is God's way always works. This is hard to understand sometimes because it doesn't seem like it's going to work, but it, but it is. Look at Daniel 1, and we'll look at just two verses, 19 and 20. And the king communed with them, and among them was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. This is back early on in their captivity. The four of them had refused to eat of the king's meat, so they said, well, just give us water and pulse, vegetables. Now, I, I'm not sure I would enjoy that diet, but I'm sure it would be a very good diet for all of us. By the way, don't say, well, we have to eat like Daniel ate. No, this was for a very, very unique and, and unusual time of life, but certainly it is a very healthy diet, we'd have to all admit. Okay, so now they're standing before the king. This is a test period. And what happened? Verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom, not just their, their physical appearance, but in all matter, uh, matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them. He found them, look at this, 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. God's way works all the time. God's way for parents to raise their children work. God's ways for a husband to treat his wife as Christ treated the church, it works. God's way for the, the wife to humbly submit herself to the leadership of her husband works. This is how God's designed us. If we just do it his way, it works. Remember that. God's way always works. These new graduates had become, or they were going to become, the personal advisors of the king. He wanted them to be their best. And when he examined these four young Hebrew boys, he found them 10 times better than those that were practicing the worldly, wicked ways, the arts of divination. Number seven, I'm either a conformer or a transformer. This is your choice. You can be a conformer or a transformer. Uh, Romans 12, verse two, it says, be not conformed. Okay? I, I always think of dog food in a can. Any of you like dog food in a can? I hope not. I would sometimes do this illustration where I'd take a can of dog food and a can of corned beef hash. You really can't tell too much difference between the two. And I would remove the label and I'd put the dog food on the corned beef hash and I'd have a, a young teenager be in on this with me and I told him, now this is not dog food, it's corned beef hash, it's totally fine to eat. 
Um, and I'd open it in front of every, all the teens, and I'd, it pops out, you know, how that just awful sound, and there it is, and I'd say, take a bite, and he would do it. And now all the, all the rest of the teens would be, oh, gross. Well, he was eating corned beef hash, not dog food. But that's what the world is trying to do to you, is make you in its mold. Look around. Look around at the trends, at the styles, at the clothes, at the haircuts. We're, we're following after the popular people. We're trying to be just like them. And that's being conformed to the world. But the Bible says, but be ye, what? Transformed. Okay? This is metamorphosis. This is going from a, 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 a caterpillar uh, crawling along on the ground to a beautiful butterfly flying through the air. That's what God wants to do for you in your life. You can either be conformed or transformed. How can we be transformed? It's right here. By the renewing of your mind. How does that happen? Here a little, there a little. Reading your scriptures, hearing sermons, getting, getting fed from the word of God, spending time with him, communicating with him in prayer. These things slowly renew our mind so our mind is no longer thinking the way of the world, but our mind is now thinking the way of Christ. That's the key to be transformed. And why? What's the point of all this? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformers don't have an easy life, but it's an exciting life. And it gives us great delight to know that God is using us to influence other people. Number eight of the 10 things that Daniel has taught me is sharing in prayer also means sharing in praise. Think about that. Remember when we talked about that? Daniel was so uh, uh, burdened because they were about to all die. And, 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 he, and, he, and he fasted and he mourned before God and he got his buddies to do the same. He said, come with me and, and mourn with me and ask God to, to help us, to, to, to show us this dream. And then once the dream was revealed to Daniel and he told the king, they all got to rejoice in their salvation. When you cry with someone, you also now have the opportunity to rejoice with them. And there are many times when you will need to, to sit with someone and, and cry with them and help them. But, but when that dawn breaks, you'll also be able to rejoice and praise the Lord, uh, the things that God has done in that situation. Daniel 2, verse 17. Daniel went to his house and made this thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men. And those four young men got together and had a great, old-fashioned, on-your-knees prayer meeting. And they sought the Lord. And they were together in this prayer. And then when God answered the prayer, they were together in rejoicing and praising God for what he had done. And then also later, they would also share the honors that Daniel enjoyed as well, being appointed as high officials in the city of Babylon. The ninth thing that Daniel has taught me is this. God is still on the throne. Is this just a saying? No, this is a truth. This is a truth. Let me read you a quote by one author. He said this. Has the enemy destroyed the holy city and the holy temple and taken God's people captive? Fear not, for there is still a godly remnant that worships the true God and serves him. Does the enemy attempt to defile the godly remnant? Fear not, for the Lord will work on their behalf and keep them separated to himself. Are godly believers needed in places of authority? Fear not, for the Lord will see to it that they are prepared and appointed. Does the Lord desire to communicate his prophetic truth to his people? 
Fear not, for he will keep his servants alive and alert until their work is done. Are you in a place of responsibility and wondering how long you can hold out? Fear not, for the same God who called you and equipped you is able to make you continue until the completed tasks that he has assigned you are done. Fear not. When God is not allowed to rule, what does he do? He overrules. God is still on the throne. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is in charge. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 1 Thessalonians 5.24 Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. If he's called you, he will do it through you if you just stay close to him. And this is the best. Number 10, the best is yet to come. Think about the last verse of Daniel. Daniel 12, 13, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest. And stand in thy lot in the end of days. There's glory ahead, there's glory awaiting. All of these trials and hardships and fiery furnaces are gonna be over. Look toward that heavenly city. Look toward the things that God has prepared for those that love him. It's gonna be unbelievable. Yeah, we had an amazing journey through the Grand Canyon. It is an incredibly beautiful, amazing place. But I think when we get to heaven and we start telling Jesus, yeah, I went to the Grand Canyon, he'd say, oh yeah, yeah, that, that was pretty much a dump, wasn't it? Just a big hole in the ground. Compared to the things that he has for us, it's just, a, it's just a ditch, right? Think about that. Think about Don't get so enamored with this world. Oh, I've got to go here and I've got to do this. Yeah, God can give you some neat opportunities, but use those opportunities for his glory. Don't get sucked into thinking, this is, I've got to go to Hawaii because it's just paradise. You know there's more homeless people in Hawaii than almost anywhere else in the world? Okay, for sure in the United States. It's not paradise for, for most people. Don't ever get sucked into that. The best is yet to come. The book of Daniel ends with this ringing note of victory. This aged prophet is still in, not, not Babylon, but in the, in the Medes and the Persian Empire. He has, we, we don't believe he ever went back to, to Israel, but he is going to stand in his lot. He's gonna stand with his kindred in the millennial kingdom where he and his Jewish people that were believers will be forever and ever and ever. It's a glorious thought. The best is yet to come. So let me challenge you with several verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 13. Gird up your lo- the loins of your mind. Be sober. Revelation 2, 10. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee what? A crown of life. Think about those things that God has in store for those that love him. For Daniel, and for all who trust in Daniel's God, the best is yet to come. Daniel's God cannot be known fully apart from Daniel's Messiah. Daniel's Messiah is the same as our Messiah, We know a lot more than Daniel did. We know his name. His name is Yeshua. In English, we say Jesus. He is the Son of God who came to this earth, who died on a cross for our sins. He had no sin, but he was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If we put our trust in the Messiah, Jesus, we are saved today, tomorrow, and forever. The best is yet to come. Now let's serve him. Let's be inspired by Daniel, that he was faithful through his whole life. You say, well, what if I've already blown it? What if I'm already in mid-age? What if I'm already old and I've just already blown it? Don't worry about that. Start today to serve him. It is worth it. Is it hard? Yeah, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Never forget that. Maybe you have never received Jesus Christ by faith. Let me encourage you to not delay another day. I saw evidence of judgment, layer after layer after layer of rock laid down. 
containing billions of fossils. But you know what you don't find in any of those sedimentary layers? You don't find human existence. We know they existed. We know they existed by the millions at the time of the flood. But God erased that group of people from the planet, obliterated it. Like 9-11, a lot of the people they never found. And that's what the flood did. There was a massive judgment upon this world because of wickedness. But there is hope today. Salvation is available today. The door of the ark was open for many years. But then it closed. And then the floods came. Jesus is the ark of salvation. If you'll put your trust in him, you're entering through the door. Jesus is the door. If you put your trust in him, not a religion, not good works, not uh, your, your church. We're not talking about putting your trust in any of that. We're talking about putting your trust in Jesus, the Son of God, who died for your sins on the cross by pouring out his blood. And then in three days he rose again, the first fruits of many that will resurrect after him to eternal life. Have you believed in him? Have you trusted in him? Have you ever remembered a time in your life when you've made that decision? Today can be the day of your salvation. And I hope that you'll put your trust in Jesus Christ. Let me show it to you this way. Let this be sin. Let this represent all of us. We've all sinned. Jesus had no sin. He died for our sins on the cross. He rose again. And if you will simply believe in him, look what happens. You have eternal life. You're in the hand of God. He's never going to lose you. He's never going to let go of you. Put your faith in Jesus. He already paid for your sins on the cross. He rose again the third day. And if you'll trust in him and him alone, you will be saved right now. Would you please bow with me as we close in prayer? Before I pray, though, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, do you remember a time when you've put your trust in Jesus? If you haven't, do it right now. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But right now I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for me and rose again. I trust in him alone. If you've made that decision today, I'd love to rejoice with you in prayer. There is judgment to come. You need to be saved. And then once you're saved, now you need to, to follow the Lord follow in his ways, to let his spirit who is in you guide you and help you. Have you made that decision today? Can I pray for you? Just hold up your hand right now. You're holding up your hand. You're saying, Pastor Scudder, today I've just put my trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Hold it up for a moment. Let me see your hand. No one's looking around. I don't want anyone to be embarrassed. Hold it up for a moment and let me pray for you and rejoice with you. Is there someone here? Let me talk to those of you that have received Jesus Christ. Do you want to serve him? Do you want to bring him glory? Do you realize that, that that's the most important thing in the world? It's not about this world. It's about the next world. That we can serve him and be faithful. If you want prayer to have the testimony that Daniel had, would you raise your hand? You're saying, Pastor Scudder, I want to have the testimony that Daniel had. Many hands. I want, to, I want to be faithful not only in my youth, in my middle age, but in my, my older years. God bless all of you. Lord, how thankful we are for the gospel of grace, that there is a future resurrection to eternal life, that if someone has received Jesus Christ by faith, they're saved. Even if they were to die, they, their soul and spirit would instantly be with you and their body would catch up one day in a glorified state. Lord, we're grateful for the study we've had, these lessons that Daniel exemplified and his companions. Lord, help us to be faithful like he was. In Jesus' precious name we pray these things and all God's people said, amen.